Good morning, New Horizons Community Church. Here on New Year's Day, the first Sunday in Tucson. And I don't know, I don't know about you, but I'm wondering right now how many of you, because I, I, I love, don't you love the beginning of a new year? When I was a younger man, staying up all night to, to New Year's Day was a big deal. But today is Sunday, and last night was New Year's Eve, so I was promptly in bed around 9 o'clock, 9.30, something like that. For Sunday, I want to give God my best, so I don't stay up late on Saturdays. I just don't do it. But I'm wondering, oh, I, I, another thing. How many of you, now let's just be honest, how many of you were not the best students in school? How many of you were not good students in school? How many of you didn't go to school? <laughs> the fact of the year, the, the fact of the matter is, is every September, I looked forward to September because I had a new opportunity for a fresh start in school. About two weeks later, I was back to my old me and struggling with the rest of the kids and somehow getting to know the principal a little better. So, those stories. But I'm wondering, with the beginning of this new year, I'm wondering how many of you, and I hope I get some, some hands here, how many of you are expecting God to do a mighty work in the life of our church this year? Let me just see the hands. Those of you, hmm? Okay, good, 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 good. Anyone else participate, uh, anticipating a better year ahead for themselves? I am. See, I, I am for myself, for my family. We're going to have a baby. Uh, our, our oldest is going to have a baby uh, May. May what? May 2nd. It's another grandson. I have four daughters. All my grandkids are boys. And that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's fun just to watch them bang around the house and they don't care. <laughs> but I'm expecting exciting things for my family and for my church. And, oh, and as we're talking about the church, I'm going to ask you right now to turn in one of my favorite books of the Bible, and that's Ephesians. Go ahead, pull the Bible out from underneath you. Hey, let's start a new habit. Let's open the Word of God in church together. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And I feel like today God's putting like a special message on my heart. And what I want to do is I want to discuss with you of what the church is. So that maybe we can get an idea of what we're about. And I want to read a passage of scripture that's typically used in marriage counseling and in relationships. Yet I believe that something deeper is going on and I want us to catch this. It's not just a natural thing, but it's a supernatural regarding the church. And I want you to turn to Ephesians. That's in the New Testament um, between Matthew and Revelation. You can find it right there. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 20. To, and to 32, and I know it's up there, and we could put these lights up here at half so we could see it better. And this is what the Bible says as we get to Ephesians. I love this scripture because it twists so many people because it, it hasn't really been explained maybe sometimes in the past, but oh, it's going to be, we're going to have a ball with this. You are. I mean, if you don't talk, if you're married or you got a girlfriend here with you or something like that or a boyfriend, and you don't talk about Scripture or the Sermon on the Way Home. Maybe you'll do it this time. It says, Wives and all the men, would you say the next word? You see how brave they are? Because they're in church. You never hear of bloodshed in a main church. Here. No, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. Starting to twist a little bit, isn't it? It's fun. I love the Word of God. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the... Don't, don't miss the, the, the symbolism here. Cleansing her by the washing, uh, uh, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and cares for it just as Christ does the church. 
for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Okay, here we go. Verse 32 I want you to look at. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Explanation time. I've gone over this. It only takes me two and a half hours. We'll be good, or less. I want to take just a few moments today, and, I, and hopefully you're taking notes. And I tell you why I want you to take notes. Research shows that 98% of the people who take notes, they make it to heaven. <laughs> so I'd take notes if I were you, if that's your final destination. I want to talk to you for a, mo a few moments about this thing called the bride, the bride. Before I do, would you just pray with me all over the place? Let's just bow our heads right now, everybody. Lord, we thank you so much that you are here. God, we thank you that you're moving. Lord, we thank you for New Horizons Community Church. And God, and the great revival that you would like to see taking place out of the four walls of this place. That's our anticipation for 2017. Lord, I pray today that, Lord, that you'd speak directly to us as we open up your word. God, we honor you and we praise you, and it's in your son's name, Jesus, the name that we pray all of these things. And if you believe it, all God's people said? Amen. And if you believe it, all God's people said? Amen. Oh, my goodness. And if you believe it, all God's people said? Amen. amen, amen, amen. Do you guys know what you say when you say amen? You're saying, so be it. Put that down. Write it down, because maybe you never knew it before. Maybe you just thought it was a Southern Baptist thing. What it means is that you are in agreement with me in our prayer to Almighty God that he indeed wants to see a great revival take place here in your, in his church. How cool is that? And all God's people said amen. Right? That is exciting, especially, especially when you say Amen. It means that you want to see a great revival in your, in his church. So as we begin a new year, I'm hoping that you will join me and many others as we prepare and as we pray. I'm going to get together with a team and we're going to talk about a revival and we're going to be searching with anticipation and hope for a close, a closer, more blessed journey with the Lord. Because honestly, I don't care what you wanted for Christmas, but that should always be our desire. Right? The old hymn went, like, just a closer walk with thee. Right? I want that. I want that individually. I want that collectively. I started uh, attending church when I was 19 years old. And, I'll, and that was, gosh, that was 35 years ago. And I'll tell you what I've learned. More specifically, what I've learned about being in church is that if you're not careful, focus with me, guys. Brand new year. If you're not careful, you can get lost and you can get caught up in doing church. And you forget to be the church. So maybe you're here today and you're going, you know, what's this whole thing with church? And it seems like everybody's excited or passionate here at New Horizons. Most of us, some of us, we rang in the new year and this is a great time to catch up on some lost sleep. Don't do that. I really want to get a good message to you guys this morning. Because really, when you think about it, this is really a cool place. So did Pastor Brian come up with that idea? No, no, it did. Pastor Brian did not come up with that idea. That idea actually was God's idea. God came up with the idea of church. So you wonder, or you say, what does the word church mean? And the word, the word church comes from the Greek word found in the New Testament, and that word is ecclesia, or ecclesia. And I love this word because ecclesia, it... It speaks about a gathering or an assembly of believers. Meaning the church is not a place. But the church is a people. That's you guys. You're the, church isn't about where. Church is about who. You and I. We are called the church. So you say, what's the purpose of the church? Well, the purpose of the church, I mean capital C... It's always been kind of like what I would say threefold. The first thing is, is that it's ministry unto God. That when we gather, when we minister unto God, we're to 
praise and bless the name of Jesus. That's why when we open our services here at New Horizon, we do it with praise and worship. Look, I, I know you can give, give me flack about this song or that song, but it's not a concert for you. It's not for one for me either, but rather it's a concert for God. We're worshiping our God. So how many of you know that when we praise our God, when we bless our God, do you know that it changes things? The psalmist said this. He said, he said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us, oh, that's you and me. Let us exalt his name. I think that psalmist was onto something. He was talking about the idea, I want to magnify. I want to bless the name of God because as I magnify the name of Jesus, his presence grows bigger in my life. You ready, guys? First question to think about. What are you magnifying today? The problem? Or are you magnifying the answer? His name is Jesus. But it's not just a ministry to God. Secondly, it's also a ministry to other believers, to you guys. Because I love this, that when we come to church, what I'm doing right now, it's called preaching. Preaching means to proclaim. And this is quite different from a lot of things that happen across the world. But what we're doing today, here on Sunday, people all over the world are doing right now. And what they're doing is they're opening up God's Word. Hope you're doing that. And when we preach, we proclaim the truth of God. And the Bible talks about the power in our preaching. And the Bible says that the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. Now, tell me if that doesn't make sense. But to us that are being saved, it is the power of God. So you out there may laugh at my God, my cross. You may laugh at the story of the serpent and the forbidden fruit. You may laugh at the, 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 the parting of the Red Sea. You may laugh, but for me, that's the power of salvation right there. Laugh all you want. Here's what I love about our God. All of us, come on, come on. All of us can have maybe a, a different journey. I guarantee that your journey is different than mine and yours is different than mine. They are different, aren't they? And I'll be honest with you, in my journey to God, I've taken more than one detour. But even though we're on this different journey, God is so big that he can speak intimately into each one of us on our journey. That's amazing. Look out, don't, hard hat area out here. As we preach, God speaks to us. Thirdly, it's not uh, just a ministry. It's not just a ministry to believers. It's a ministry to this world. This is where I want you to catch fire as well. See, that you and I, we gather here on Sunday, and we're supposed to, after that, scatter to you know, scattered for the rest of the week. We're supposed to be the church at work, at, be the church at school, be the church in our neighborhood. It was Jesus that said, upon this rock, I will build my house and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Don't you love the idea that Jesus is giving for us? That we're to be such a, a progressive, such an aggressive church that we are literally rescuing people from hell. That's awesome. You ought to take that home with you. So how many here, you want to be a church that's stepping out into the world, ministering to the world, and rescuing people? Come on. Are we awake? Someone say amen. Give a shout out to God. Amen? Okay. We're to minister to the world as a church. Because I'll tell you why. I, and it's not in your notes, and I don't tell Sabrina what to put in the notes, but I just want you to remember this one. As a church... Whatever we avoid, the devil will invade. Whatever we avoid, the devil will invade. You leave that neighbor alone, you haven't left him alone. The devil's all over him. You got that estranged relationship with a family member and you're too prideful to talk about and you're going to leave him alone. They're not alone. The devil's all over him. We shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be ashamed. We, we should be bold and we should be courageous and we should step out into the night with the light of Jesus Christ. Amen? 
So be it. Come on. So as you study God's word, what you'll find out is when it comes to the ecclesia, the gathering, the church, is that there's a lot of different metaphors. Paul will use the metaphor that we are the body of Christ, that each one of us has a different function. And that as we serve, we become the body of Christ. He'll talk about the idea that we are the building of Christ, that you and I are, are living stones being laid up one another on top to build a home for God. Yes, and one of the most peculiar metaphors used in the Bible that I've always found kind of interesting is that you and I are called the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. Have you ever wondered why we're called the bride of Christ? Why is the church you guys called the bride? Next August, Karen and I, Karen and I, we're going to celebrate 25 years of marriage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 25 years of marriage to the same woman. Praise God. My wife is my partner. She's everything to me. I've been doing life with her since I was about 28 years old. And you know, I was thinking it would be kind of crazy. Just track with me for a minute, you people, about the church. I think it would be kind of crazy if any of you ever walked up to me and said, Hey, Brian, I love you, man. I'm, I'm for you, Brian. I got your back. But hey, Brian, to be honest with you, I really don't like your wife. I really don't like Karen very much, you know. I, I really don't like your wife. How many of you think I might have a problem with that statement? You know why? Because you can't love me and not like my wife. Where are you going with this? Yet, how many Christians have I met that say, oh, I love Jesus, I just don't like the church. Hey, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Hey, church is boring. Church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. I wanted you to finish it for me. That was my lead-in. Church is full of a bunch of Oh. Now, I think if we would just stop and reflect a little bit more on what we're saying and understand who we are as the church, we would never say any of this nonsense. Because if we're the bride of Christ, there is no way to say I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. You can't do it. It's like saying, I love you, Jesus, but I don't like your bride. Come on. Fighting words. I know you don't have to go to church to be qualified as a Christian, but come on, if you love Jesus and you're a Christian, why would you not want to go to church? Church is boring? Don't ever say that, because the church is you and me, remember? I refuse to be boring. You're boring? To walk, I'm in here a lot of times by myself. Because you guys are out there doing your lives, and maybe Sabrina's gone, or, or, and I'll walk in here, and never have I walked in this room and go, you're boring! Because this building is not the church. We've just established that, haven't we? You people are the church. So come on, we're not boring. It's who you and I are. The church is full of hypocrites. Are you just now figuring this out? Yes, you are correct. The church is full of hypocrites because the church is full of people and people have a tendency to say one thing and do another. That's why we come to church because we are in need of a Savior. Anybody thankful that you serve a God who's not a hypocrite? But you serve a God who came and saved you and always he's lived out what he says. Paul himself said, why do I do the things I don't want to do? And the things I want to do, I don't do. What's he saying? He's, this is Paul. If you grab the New Testament, he wrote most of that. This is Paul. And what he's saying is, is I'm a hypocrite, and I'm in need of a Savior. But I don't come to church to be reminded of my weakness. I come to church to be reminded of his strength. I know you're weak. We fall apart all the time. But my God is not a hypocrite. My God provides me grace so I can walk out my race. 
So I want to try and answer a few questions the next few moments that we have really quick. And maybe just three benefits of the reasons why I believe that you and I are called the bride of Christ. And I just, I just want us to write these down real quick. And I think these things will help you. I could give you a lot of reasons why I believe. But I'm just going to give you three reasons. And I believe that God and the scriptures say why we are the bride of Christ. The first reason is this. Paul, a- as he's writing, he says this. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I think the first word that comes to my mind as I think about that is the word intimacy. Everybody say intimacy. You know why I do that? So we can get some air in us and we can engage. Come on, church, we can do better than that. Everyone say intimacy. Intimacy. Yeah, because I really believe the first reason we're called the bride is is because God wants intimacy with you and I. Out of all the things he could have likened us to, we're likened to a bride. Now, I don't know if there's a more intimate place. This is going to, I'm glad the kids aren't in here. There's not a more intimate place than the marriage bed between a husband and a wife. God is trying to say, that's the type of the relationship I want with my church. So maybe you're here right now and you're going, hey, pastor, uh, the message isn't getting for me here, bro. I, 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 it's getting kind of weird. I'm really not into God romancing me. I'm really not into God calling me his bride. And because, probably because you're a dude and you don't understand the difference between something that's literal and something that's a metaphor, okay? A metaphor is talking about something and we're trying to find, to bring a resemblance of it to your life. This is not a literal thing, but rather it's a metaphor. God is trying to find something on this earth to show you the level of intimacy he wants with you. Real intimacy, I think it's all about trust. I do a lot of marriage and premarital counseling, and I tell them it's about trust. It's also about love. I think you have to have both for a good marriage, don't you? For years, I was a minister on staff. I wasn't the senior pastor. I served under several senior pastors each with a different set of gifts for leading and shepherding the church. Some were great at casting vision. Some were great in administration. Some excelled at preaching. Some were great at mentoring. Out of all the pastors that I served under, the one I prefer most, he was not great at casting vision or administration or even preaching. He was an okay preacher, don't get me wrong. But for the most part, the operations of the church, they ran smoothly. In staff meetings, we rarely have ever heard the word vision or mission. The uncommon thread from this pastor that made everyone believe that the Owego First Church of the Nazarene in Owego, New York, was the place, to, was a wonderful place to call church, was that our senior pastor exemplified the love of Christ. He loved his church. He loved his staff. He loved his wife. And he loved his Lord. When you squeezed Dr. Jim Daniels, love came out. That's just all there was to it. And today, when I look at our church, at you people, the easiest words for me to say when I think of you guys is, I love you, and I do. Do you know how much I love you? I pray that God is doing something new in my heart, because I think it is, and I think he's expanding my heart. Because I love you, and I pray for you. I want your businesses to flourish. I want your marriages to thrive. I love you. I love you, but do you know how I, how do I love you? To answer that question, I have to tell you that I do love you, but I do love my wife in a different kind of way. And I know you're thinking, thank goodness. How many of you know that my wife loves me in a different kind of way? And I say, thank goodness. How many of you know that I know my wife and my wife knows me in a different kind of way that I know you? Yeah. I just got to thank God from the front row. What if God is saying, I want to know you, the word know, I want to know you in a different way. What if God is inviting you to know him in a different way, in an intimate way, in a way that's full of trust? See, trust? I I like the idea of intimacy. To know me, to know me, you have to look into me and see me, and I mean the real me. Let's go back to dating for a second. How many of you know that when we date, we, we date the projected self? Do you understand? 
We date the projected self, but we marry the actual self. Hmm? When people are dating, man, that's the best version. Hey, how you doing? Oh, I love you so much. Oh, my goodness, I love you. You love blue? Blue is my favorite color, too. Oh, my goodness. You like pizza? I like pizza. You like it cold? I love it cold. And then you get on the phone, and there's nothing sillier than watching two young people in love because they're so stupid. They're like, they're like, you hang up, okay? I love you, okay? Good, good, good night, good night. Shut up, shut up. No, 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 no. Good night, good night, good night, good night. Okay, ready? One, two, three. You still there? <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> we do it. We, we all have done that. I hope you've all done that. That's part of being a young person. You date the projected self, and then <laughs> you, you, you wake up. And one day you go, who's that? Because the actual self shows up. What God is saying is, I'm not interested in the projected you. I love the real you. I want to know the real you. I don't mean the church version of you. I want the real you. I want intimacy. And I believe that God calls us the bride because we're done projecting. He wants to know us and he wants, to know, he wants us to know him in an intimate way. Good preaching, ain't it? Yeah, stay with me. Stay w- I had to save a good message for New Year's Day because a lot of us are sleepy. Okay, next week I don't guarantee anything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Paul will continue to say that Christ gave, him up, gave himself up for her, that we may be holy and blameless and blemish-free, wrinkle-free. That would be a pure bride. See, I think the first reason we're called the bride is for intimacy. But the second reason is for protection. Everyone say protection. Protection. Hoo-ah. I believe that the church is protected by our Father. As you read the text, this is one of those controversial parts in Scripture where the Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands. Now notice, it doesn't say women submit to men, and it doesn't say women submit to all husbands, but rather it says women submit to your husband. And see, I see a lot of women get upset about this, but come on, can you read the next portion of Scripture? It says, husbands Love your wives like Christ loved the church. Now, I don't know who gets the shorter end of the deal. Women have to submit to husbands, but guess what? I have to die for you. That's what Christ did for the church. Girls have to submit. Guys have to die. Either we both have a responsibility here. And the question is, ladies, can you be a girl that's worth dying for? And men... Can you be a man that's worth submitting to? You see, Paul is writing, and he's saying, Christ loved the church so much that he died for the church. Now, I know you're looking at me, and it's kind of pretty dangerous. You'd probably think, well, I, you know, I'm a big dude. But maybe you think I'm a skilled fighter, and I'm not. I used to box in high school, but I haven't done it since then. So I'm really not a fighter. I'm more of a lover. People, people look at me, and my daughters used to say that when they'd bring a boyfriend to the house, I'd always scare them. I never tried to. It just comes natural. <laughs> I'm not into fighting. The other thing is guns. Like, right, seriously, because look, let's say you're a 90-year-old grandmother, and if you have a gun, it doesn't matter how much taekwondo or boxing or whatever, you're taking me out with a gun. I'm not going to mess with you because you might have a gun today. I want to take you to a story. In my mid-20s, I was driving to work about 4 a.m. in the streets of Pontiac, Michigan. Pretty scary. Uh, the streets were pretty empty at that time in the morning, and I worked in tool and dye at the time. To date myself, I was wearing a, a jean jacket, some jeans, and I was wearing these work boots, okay? And they had the steel toe in them, right? And in tool and dye, you would walk on some serious thick metal shavings, so the sole and the heel had to be very thick. So it made me literally about two and a half inches taller. I was robbed of merchant size and then some, okay? 
So I'm stopped at a light at 4 a.m. in Pontiac. And just to let you know, Pontiac, Michigan is a dangerous place, especially at 4 a.m. So I'm stopped at the light, and a guy rear-ends me. True story. Now, I'm not hurt, but I step out of my car as if to see there's any damage to my car. And as I'm walking to the car, do you know what that guy did? He backed up his car, and he took off. Now, I don't know if he didn't have a license or if he didn't have insurance or if I just looked scary to him and he fled in fear. I guess it didn't really matter because he wasn't getting away with it. This was well before cell phones, so the only rational thing I could do was climb back into my six-cylinder 1978 Granny, eight, uh, uh, granny Beige Dodge Dart Swinger and chase him down. We made several turns through the streets of downtown Pontiac. We even went through a couple of red lights. This guy's not getting away with it. I don't even know what he did to my car, if anything, but still, you don't hit and run me. So as I'm getting closer, I hear my dad's voice in my head. Son, you don't want to mess with some people, son, because they'll have a gun and they'll shoot you. So, I gave it a little more thought, and I watched his taillights fade into the dark. I was like, I don't want a problem. I'm not a fighter. You can bump my car. You can walk on my grass. You can talk bad about me, and it's okay. I'm a grown man. Remember, we're talking about protection of the church. Watch. But my friend, mark my words, if you mess with my wife, that's a whole different story. And all the men said, amen. Right. If you mess with my wife, if you come to bring my, uh, harm to my wife, all of a sudden I am prepared. I am ready by any means necessary. Now don't miss this. I'm talking about God. I am, when, according to my, when it comes to my wife, I am going to do anything necessary to step in the middle and protect my wife, because she's my responsibility. I will do anything that I need to do. I will even die for her if I have to. Come on, can you see that this is how much God loves you? Because you don't? God has already stepped in the gap so many different times, and maybe, maybe you don't even know it. And maybe you won't even know it until you get to the other side of heaven, until we get to the other side of eternity, that we'll find out just how many times the Lord God stepped in to protect your hiney. True. That's why when you come to church, you don't, co don't come to church for something to pump you up. You don't have to wait for the worship team to play your favorite song. You ought to come to God's house, lift in holy hands, and start worshiping God because you know God has shown up already many times and he stood in the gap for you. You see, this isn't just good preaching, it's good theology. Because right smack in the middle of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul gives us the gospel. So how do I know God will, will protect you? Because he did it 2,000 years ago. Jesus came and he walked on the earth and he died a sinner's death. In fact, he died your death and he died my death on a cruel cross. He died the death to take the punishment of your sin, of, my, of sin. He took the curse of sin when he died. And guess what? His life, all of a sudden, it protected you. Because now, as you look in the mirror and you see more wrinkles than before, less hair than before, maybe an age spot or maybe an extra pound or two, since the cross, you are called spotless. You are called blameless. You are called righteous. You! Not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. You are spotless. You are the spotless, blemish-free bride. And it's called grace. He protected you. 
So maybe you're here today and you're going, Brian, that sounds absolutely unfair and wrong. Why would God protect me, who's perfect? Well, this is the scandal of our gospel. That God stepped into eternity and died for us. Now, I know I'm at New Horizons Church right now, and I know that this is a spiritually awesome bunch of people. The greatest church in the world has the best Christians in the world, the biggest mansions in heaven we're waiting for. I know it. And I know you don't judge people, but I do sometimes. I do. Have you ever, like, I don't care where it is, a restaurant, a, a school, or, or, or a, a, oh, school was awful about this, but maybe, maybe you're at work or something, and you're hanging out, you're at Walmart, or you're hanging out somewhere, and a couple walks in. And as they walk by the girl, she's absolutely gorgeous, she's beautiful, and then you see the guy that's on, on the arm of this beautiful girl, and you're like, um, how'd that happen? I think you know what I'm saying. You're kind of like, okay, dude, dude, bro, you must have some money or something. I don't know, all right? Dude's got money. Do you, do you, do you, do you got money? Because you're looking at it, and it causes attention. Now, how many of you know, how many of you know when you look at that couple, because she's gorgeous, and he's, as my father would say, ugly as a mud fence. I don't know what that means. But you look at those, and immediately you judge. Don't tell me you don't judge. I know you do. Because you know what you say? She's way out of his league. And you're looking at it, and you're going, wow, that's kind of peculiar, right? That's strange. How did he get her? How many of you know that when the world looks at the church, they see you? They see us. And they see us with all of our problems and all of our issues and all of our weakness and all of our hypocrisy and all of our scandals. But as they look at us, they see our Savior and they say, how on earth did that guy pick them? Well, what you ought to say is, it's called grace. It's grace. That's the, that's the scandal of the gospel. He chose me. He's way out of my league, but he chose me. He protected me, and today I'm blemish-free. I'm wrinkle-free, and I'm, I'm a spotless bride. And it's not because of what I've done. It's because of what Jesus has done. He chose me, and he's way out of my league, but he chose me. So the first reason I think we're called the bride, that's, that's for intimacy. The second reason I think we're called the bride is for protection. And the last reason, Paul continues, he says, this is what he says, he goes, at an appointed time, a man will leave his mother and father, and he will be united to a woman, and the two will become one flesh. This is what I love. He says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. The first reason, intimacy. The second reason, protection. And the third, we're called the bride, is that because we have rights, we have rights because of Jesus. Now, don't miss this. This is awesome. We have rights. We are one with Jesus. You know, I just told you that Karen and I are going to celebrate 25 years of marriage, and my wife, I wish she was up here right now. I'd like to brag on her. I was hoping that she would be in church today because sometimes she works with the kids. But I put it on the screen for everybody to read. No. Now, with that, I want to take you back to the days of when I was a kid. In the following scenario, we would, it would, when I was a kid, it would be nothing out of the ordinary to have a salesman call the house, and the salesman would ask for the man of the house. The what? That's right, the man of the house. How many of you remember those days? Okay. Do you know why he would ask for the man of the house? You see, back then, the salesman didn't want to waste time speaking to the wife because everyone knew that back then, the man made the decisions. Well, not all the decisions, but, you know, women made decisions, but the man made the important decisions. Now, if the fuller brush salesman came to the door to sell a mop or a broom, Mom, there's someone here for you. But to refinance the home or buy that shiny new aluminum siding for the house, let me speak to the man of the house, please. Does anybody remember those days? I'm kind of glad those days are over. Okay? Do you know that if you're talking to my wife, you're talking to me? Did you get that? And heaven help the salesperson that says they need to speak to her husband. Really? Do you know why? Because she could, and not just with my permission, but I'd be in the back cheering her on. 
She could say, you don't need to talk to my husband. You don't need to get, for me to get my husband on the phone. You've got me on the phone right now, and when you're talking to me, you're talking to him. Because Karen Butler carries the name Karen Hale. Because she carries, she could tell that, that, that salesman, I carry his name and I have the same rights. So whatever you're looking for, guess what? I have the authority. Friends, it reminds me of what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8. He said that if you and I are willing to share in Christ's suffering, then guess what? We will also share in his glory. So I have good news for the church of Jesus Christ because of Jesus, when you put your faith your trust and your faith in him, all of a sudden you get the same rights. Today you are the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And when you pray prayers, according to the book of James, the Bible says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Aren't you thankful that you're not standing in your own righteousness, but you're standing in his? So you have the same rights as Jesus. When you pray, God hears the prayers of Jesus. You have rights today. So I want to challenge everyone here. Seriously, if you've been listening to me, I know I've used a lot of words to try and get a point across. But honestly, church, I don't care if you're tired. I don't care if you're worn out. It's time to rise up like never before. Oh, I know that God has done some amazing things in the past, but I really do believe that the best is still yet to come. So let's not get lost in doing church. Let's declare and decide in our spirit that we are going to be the church. We know who we are. We're the ecclesia. My very first sermon here, I said, in a hundred years from now, this place will be dust. These buildings can come down, but praise God, our God still rules and reigns, and we are his bride. So we have the intimacy. We have the protection. And we have the rights because of Jesus Christ. Come on, if you believe it. Somebody say amen in this house. So be it. Amen? Hallelujah. I want to pray for you. All across this worship center, I just want to pray. Let me just, let's just bow our heads. Let's just pray. Let me pray today that God would begin to give you a new revelation of who you are as the church. Right now. Lord, we thank you so much for speaking to us. God, we thank you for your mighty word. God, we thank you right now, Lord, that you are here. So wherever we find ourselves, whatever we're going through, Lord, we open up our hearts right now, Lord, for you to come and to speak and to minister to us. God, we thank you, Lord, that you want intimacy with us, God. We thank you that you have protected us, Lord. And God, we thank you that you have given us rights. Lord, I pray that we would begin to Pray prayers, Lord, that are bold, Lord, that we would begin to be the people, Lord, that step up and to be the church wherever we are, not just in this place. God, we thank you for all that you've done, Lord, and we declare in the name of Jesus Christ that there is so much more to come. We praise you and we love you in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said... Amen. I love you, church. Thank you so much. Now go and be the church that magnifies his name throughout the week. Amen.